questions for the future. Organized by the uh, China Ministry of Finance and also Asia Development Bank, and also co organized by the SNI AFDI 2023 AEW is officially commencing now. We also thank all of the participants in this AEW, and I look forward to learning from all of you in the coming days and to some vibrant discussions on the challenges ahead. Thank you. I wish you a fruitful discussion. I look forward to learning not only from our speakers, but also from all, participation, uh, all participants. Thank you very much. This AEW 2023 could, we hope, script the story of recharge and resilience that we could proudly take home to our children. Once again, our heartfelt welcome to each one of you, and we really wish you a very memorable stay. G'day, my name's Andrew Lee, the Assistant Minister for Treasury in the Australian Government. And it's a real pleasure to be joining you virtually uh, for Asian Evaluation Week. Evaluation is an issue that's close to my heart. Before entering politics, I was a professor of economics at the Australian National University. And I've long been committed to the idea that we ought to do a better job in evaluating the impact of policies. In my book, Randomisters, I outlined how randomised evaluations have changed the way in which bed nets are delivered. There was an argument for a time that if bed nets were handed out free uh, to help protect against malaria, then people wouldn't be as likely to use them, that some co-payment was desirable instead. So large-scale randomised trials were conducted in a range of developing countries. And the results were clear. Those who received free bed nets were just as likely to use them. And free meant that many more people took them up. That translated into practice and has acted to save thousands of lives across Africa and the rest of the developing world. This is just one example of how randomised trials can make a difference. In the 2023 budget, the Australian government established the Australian Centre for Evaluation, tasked with the mandate of carrying out high quality randomised trials across government. Among the agencies we're looking to partner with are international de development work being done in Australia. We understand the obligation for Australia of ensuring that the aid we deliver has the maximum positive impact. Already, Australia has been a strong supporter of JPAL Indonesia. And we understand that their multilateral institutions will do their very best work when they're driven by evidence rather than ideology. The issue of ethics occasionally arises when we discuss randomised trials. Certainly, if we know for sure that an intervention works, then it's unethical to deny it to the control group. But there's a flip side to that. If we don't know whether an intervention works, then in my view, it's unethical not to find out. We just cannot countenance programs being rolled out without a strong evidence base behind them. So all the best for your conversations. I'd love to be with you there in Bangkok talking about these issues and more. It is so vital to those who we serve through national governments and multilateral institutions that we improve the rigour of evaluations, that we build more randomised trials into how we develop policies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And if I can be of use in the conversations, please don't hesitate to reach out directly. Thanks again. The greatest paradox and problem for government accountability, and that is that we live in a world of short-termism, even in the way we do cost-benefit analysis, where a high discount rate forces us to value short-term benefits over the longer-term benefits. And I think this is the great challenge, to balance the needs of the generation today and future generations. Thank you very much. I came to realize that no consciousness of accountability is complete unless it is soldered firmly on public good. Like climate change, 
like regional cooperation, journalism is a public good. And public goods cannot exist without love and compassion. And he showed me the columns for porridge, for water, for sugar, for flour, for firewood. And he said, you see, Megan, we have porridge. And I said, yes, I see you have porridge in the Excel sheets. But I want to have porridge in the bellies and the stomachs of the children at the school. Because that's where we really need porridge. Thank you. So this is about accounting. We don't need more accounting. Accounting is, of course, important. But we need accountability. Evaluation to continue to be relevant and to continue to be useful had to be agile and flexible, that we adapt our methodology, our approaches, so that we bring the evidence-based evaluation evidence that um, our colleagues need, that our clients need, and that the community needs. Evaluation has to be consequential. Good examples of being consequential uh, every time that I go to the board, always we, we, we speak with the team. How would the board know? How would they know all of this information if we would have not uh, produced this work? A lot of money is put into uh, these activities. If uh, we are not consequential, you better put the money in projects. I think moving forward, it's fundamental that evaluation is timely. Timely in two senses. Firstly, in terms of the topics that are chosen for evaluation. That we make sure we choose the most relevant topic that can co contribute to inducing change in our institutions and, and in our member countries. But timely also in terms of how we deliver those evaluations and the timeliness in terms of delivering those evaluations. You heard it here in evaluation used at AEW, make a difference is what everyone seems to be saying. Got some great lessons from them, how to do that, and how to measure it. Are new projects taking to on board our lessons? Is there more demand for our services as evaluators? Mm -hmm. Are we building a culture of learning in the institution? Are we able to work with our institutions regardless of whether top management is sympathetic or not? And are we able to build the capacity, not just of our own evaluators, but those who are going to use it?
Isn't it great to have AEW back in person again? Yeah! Isn't it great to be in Bangkok? Yeah! Pump and cup, thank you very much. And please, join me in fruitful discussions for the future. Organized by the uh, China Ministry of Finance and also Asia Development Bank, and also co organized by the SNI AFDI 2023 AEW is officially commencing now. We also thank all of the participants in this AEW, and I look forward to learning from all of you in the coming days and to some vibrant discussions on the challenges ahead. Thank you. I wish you a fruitful discussion. I look forward to learning not only from our speakers, but also from all, participation, uh, all participants. Thank you very much. This AEW 2023 could, we hope, script a story of recharge and resilience that we could proudly take home to our children. Once again, our heartfelt welcome to each one of you, and we really wish you a very memorable stay. G'day, my name's Andrew Lee, the Assistant Minister for Treasury in the Australian Government. And it's a real pleasure to be joining you virtually uh, for Asian Evaluation Week. Evaluation is an issue that's close to my heart. Before entering politics, I was Professor of Economics at the Australian National University. And I've long been committed to the idea that we ought to do a better job in evaluating the impact of policies. In my book, Randomisters, I outlined how randomised evaluations have changed the way in which bed nets are delivered. There was an argument for a time that if bed nets were handed out free uh, to help protect against malaria, then people wouldn't be as likely to use them, that some co-payment was desirable instead. So large-scale randomised trials were conducted in a range of developing countries. And the results were clear. Those who received free bed nets were just as likely to use them. And free meant that many more people took them up. That translated into practice and has acted to save thousands of lives across Africa and the rest of the developing world. This is just one example of how randomised trials can make a difference. In the 2023 budget, the Australian Government established the Australian Centre for Evaluation, tasked with the mandate of carrying out high-quality randomised trials across government. Among the agencies we're looking to partner with are international de development work being done in Australia. We understand the obligation for Australia of ensuring that the aid we deliver has the maximum positive impact. Already, Australia has been a strong supporter of JPAL Indonesia. And we understand that the multilateral institutions will do their very best work when they're driven by evidence rather than ideology. The issue of ethics occasionally arises when we discuss randomised trials. Certainly, if we know for sure that an intervention works, then it's unethical to deny it to the control group. But there's a flip side to that. If we don't know whether an intervention works, then in my view, it's unethical not to find out. We just cannot countenance programs being rolled out without a strong evidence base behind them. So all the best for your conversations. I'd love to be with you there in Bangkok talking about these issues and more. It is so vital to those who we serve through national governments and multilateral institutions that we improve the rigour of evaluations, that we build more randomised trials into how we develop policies. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And if I can be of use in the conversations, please don't hesitate to reach out directly. Thanks again.
idea at this fantastic conference. Thanks to, to the organizers. Thanks, Nani, sure. for Okay, thank you. Um, so we are, we are really um, pleased to be here and I'm, I'm honored to be on um, a panel with really esteemed colleagues. Um, you can see all their amazing profiles uh, in the, the speaker um, info, but um, I'll just hand the, the mic over to them so that they can say a few words about them themselves. Patricia. Okay, um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. I'm from Australia, uh, which is part of Asia and um, um, yeah, delighted to be able to talk about innovations, how we can do evaluation better. Good morning, I'm Maya Vijay Raghwan from the Independent Evaluation Department of the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and I'm happy to be here with my fellow speakers and I think it's gonna be a very interesting session. Hi everybody, my name is Dugan Fraser. I'm the program manager of an intervention called the Global Evaluation Initiative, which is housed in the Independent Evaluation Group of the World Bank. We're a joint initiative with the UNDP's Independent Evaluation Office, and we work to strengthen monitoring and evaluation capacity in developing countries. Uh, I'm very excited to share some of what we're learning, but more than anything, I'm very excited to learn from my peers and from you all today. Thank you very much for being here. Good morning. Uh, it's always difficult to be last, but my name is Andreas. Uh, I come from the Independent Evaluation Unit of the Green Climate Fund in South Korea. Um, I'm very delighted to have such a diverse group here, but also in the room. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we can have. Thank you. And we'll have plenty of time for conversation and even a second mic for, for the panel. So um, that will speed up things. Um, so um, first, maybe a, a small dis disclaimer, esteemed colleagues. Um, what we're gonna show you to today um, is maybe not sort of rocket science, um, the most advanced cutting edge stuff that um, you may may read on, on the news. Um, what we're gonna show to you is um, after sort of some, some initial thoughts about what actually I innovation is, is how we in our daily work try to improve evaluations, try to move the envelope a step further um, using technology, using different tools, using, using partnerships, using existing knowledge. So um, hopefully, this will be stuff that is useful for you in, in your daily work. Um, but first of all, Patricia, what is actually innovation? Can you unpack that for us sure. a bit? Oh, you have, this, you have the clicker, thank you. Oh, Can we, we go ahead, good. yep. So um, before we start um, showcasing our innovations, we wanted to share some thoughts about what we mean by innovation, um, some different types of innovation and what helps the uptake of it because innovation is about doing things differently in a way that adds value. So it's not just doing things differently for the sake of it, not just to say I've done something new, but because there's a reason to do it, that it adds value. Um, <coughs> so each of the innovations we're gonna talk about responds to a need where the existing evaluation methods, processes and structures were not sufficient. And that puts you in a scary place. Uh, sometimes an anxious place because you're having to do something new because there's a need, something it matters. And when we talk about innovation, people often think about it in terms of invention, inventing something new, a, a new machine, a new thing. And sometimes it's about that, but very often it's one of these other types. Um, it's often about translation, taking something that's used in one context and applying it somewhere else and having to adapt it to fit. So um, there's a lot of methods, for example, in impact evaluation, and you'll have seen in the um, video before this session, uh, talking about impact evaluation and RCTs as one of the approaches, which is great when you can construct a counterfactual. What do you do when you can't? Well, impact evaluation can draw on methods that have been developed in other disciplines and other sectors. So we're bringing in process tracing, which has been used in, developed in political science. We're bringing in multiple lines and levels of evidence, which was developed in natural resources management. And so evaluators have, have to then learn about these new ways of doing it and learn from what's been done in a different context. 
Another form of innovation is bricolage. It's a French word about putting bits and pieces together to make something new. And that's often what we do as really practical, pragmatic evaluators, right? How do we put it together to do something that's going to work? And um, again, in impact evaluation, um, there's an approach called collaborative outcomes reporting that picked up multiple lines, of, of, uh, lines and levels of evidence. It picked up expert review. It picked up community uh, panels and put them together into a package to, to do impact evaluation. And then the other one is about uh, systematisation. And that's looking at people who are doing something new and trying to document what it is. Sometimes when people are good at something, they don't even notice all the things they're doing, all the little steps in there. And so watching someone who's doing something new and starting to document it and to systematise it, make it accessible to other people, that can be a form of, of innovation. So please um, keep those different uh, types of innovation in mind as we're, as we're talking. Oh yes, and the picture. Yes, here's someone, the innovation here is how to peel, how to peel onions without having your eyes water, okay? So here's a, here's a need that's not met by the current technology and so we innovate a bit of bricolage, you put a couple of extra things together and you, you have a new, a new way of doing it. Okay, thank you, next one. Hmm. Okay, and, I'll, I'll and that's it. And then the other thing is to think about, well, what helps the uptake of innovation? Um, and I just love these lemurs just looking like, yes, yeah, so, um, at this innovation. What, what need does it meet and how do you take it up? And what, what helps with that? Uh, <laughs> Seconds for the slide. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I had a bit of I was starting now, right? <laughs> well, this is great. I thank you for the demonstration because it's relative advantage. Is this actually better than doing it the other way? And is that really obvious, right? It can, compared to what? Um, it, does it have a, a relative advantage? And, and that will help people pick it up. Um, is it easy to understand? Is it easy to implement? Or it's hard? Yeah, good. Um, and can you trial it? Can you do it on a small scale at lower risk and, um, and then learn from that? Um, are you going to need special equipment or special training? Are you going to have to <laughs> totally <laughs> redo your guidance, <laughs> your, your, your policies and procedures <laughs> um, to do that? Um, and really, fundamentally coming back to, is it addressing a real need for you? Or is it just, well, that's really nice, but that's not important to me. So. Um, we're going to start with the first example um, and look forward to your comments at the end of that. So Maya's going to start, please. I think right on cue, this one actually starts working now. Oh, good. So, yeah. All right. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, talking about two innovations. Oh, talk straight into it. All right. How about now? You can you hear me? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have something else to play with, all right? We can do this. Uh, okay, so I'm going to focus on two things. Uh, one is virtual missions, right? Virtual missions are something that emerged as a result of the pandemic. And because everyone was used to actually having meetings online, it became easy to actually transition to having virtual missions after the pandemic, because culturally acceptable now. And in situations where there is no need to be on the ground to talk with beneficiaries, and the main interaction is going to be with some officials in the capital city, it's very easy to just set up virtual meetings. It's much more environment friendly. It's much more cost effective. Uh, saves you know everybody a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money. So that's something that we have embraced. Ah, yeah. Okay. So to the left is what you see uh, emissions before the pandemic. Everyone got on a plane, went to these countries, met literally with the ministers in the countries, and then got back on the flight and came back. Uh, but after the pandemic, of course, you know, we have moved more or less into virtual missions for some specific types of evaluations, particularly for validations where you know, you're just doing a check on the evidence and maybe you need a little bit more confirmation from the countries. So it's worked very well for us, and I think this is here to stay. 
Uh, remember that this was inconceivable before the pandemic. So I think that's one of the good outcomes that have emerged uh, as a result of the pandemic and everyone just you know, working on their computers at home. Uh, the other advantage of having these virtual missions, of us moving to these virtual missions, is there is also an opportunity to build local capacity for evaluation. Because sometimes we may need to use uh, evidence from the local beneficiaries, but if we can't necessarily make it there, we train some uh, local consultants. So that's also a way to build local capacity and also empower local evaluators without having someone from another international organization looking over their shoulders. So I think it's also, in a small way, it's building capacity. So I think those are the two, uh, those are the things that have sort of helped us uh, justify virtual missions. And so we, also, we still do regular missions, you know, get on flights and go to countries. But that's, uh, I think, in cases where you actually need to, uh, I guess, collect data on the ground and also ground truth some of what you're hearing from these interviews. So that's uh, virtual missions. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is our use of geospatial data. You know, uh, geospatial data, data that have latitude, longitude mapped out, so it's location-specific data. And of course, you have a whole host of geographic information systems available now. And there's a lot of free geospatial data available uh, from remote sensing satellites. Uh, I guess it's Copernicus from the Europeans, the NASA Landsat data from the US, and there's several others, the JAXA, of course, the Japanese, uh, I guess, space station. Uh, so this example, the first one I'm going to show you is how we used uh, remote sense, remote satellite data to actually select comparison towns for an impact evaluation. So my colleague and I were tasked with evaluating the impact of a small town's water supply and sanitation project in Nepal that was uh, approved by the Asian Development Collected. Oh. All right, I guess I have to transition to this one. Put that away. <laughs> Give me a minute. Yeah. Okay, mute that. Okay, yeah. Um, so the issue that we faced with was at the time that the project was approved, no baseline data was collected. Okay, so there were 29 towns that got this intervention, but there was no baseline data collected. Uh, it was not set up. Uh, to be evaluated the way that we had to evaluate it as in an impact evaluation. Uh, so there were no comparison towns either uh, that were selected at the time the project was approved. So what do we do? Uh, we thought a great deal and then came up with this solution. So what we did was went back to the year 2000 uh, and looked at what these towns look like. So what you see on the slide in the top left corner, that was the municipality that received the intervention. And we consulted with uh, several local experts and asked them to suggest uh, plausible comparison towns, say, in the year 2000. Yeah? So people who'd been there for a long time, understood the system, understood the country. So they gave us three different names. Uh, and that's what you see in the other three quadrants. So what we did was we uh, used just as remote sense data, um, and you can see all the features uh, that show up in these four quadrants. And we just, just by visual inspection, picked the one that looked closest to the project town. So question for you. Uh, Triuga was the project town. So which one looks like the closest comparison? The one below it, uh, the one next to it, or the one diagonally across from it? Which one? We picked. Yeah? All right. OK, here's the answer. So the one that we picked was Qatari, which is the one right below Triuga, which is the uh, project town. Yeah. 
Um, so we did this uh, for nine other towns. So as I said, originally there were 29 towns that received the intervention. We picked 10 that had a fairly diverse geography uh, and topography, just to make sure that we covered you know, all the characteristics that we would hope to see across the country. And we repeated this for the other nine, and I think we got reasonably good comparison, comparison towns. So yeah, so this is something we adopted. Uh, we really didn't have anything to work with. This seemed like a reasonable way to, you know, to at least get a handle on some comparison town. Yeah, and of course, we didn't have baseline data, so we just had an after comparison, but at least we had a, we had a project and a comparison town um, for the impact evaluation. So that's one application. Um, and after this one, so this was in 2017, a report was published in 2018. And after that, we actually adopted this methodology for a few of our evaluations, particularly in agriculture, natural resources, and environmental interventions. Um, as you know, for those sectors, the interventions can be hard to monitor as well as to evaluate because it's dispersed over a fairly large geographic area. So it's quite a task if you have to physically uh, collect the data and then evaluate it. So yeah, so it was, you know, since we started using geographic information systems and geospatial data, that seemed like a natural next step. So we used it for that. Uh, after that, we also started using nighttime luminosity data as a proxy for economic growth. Uh, for the economists in the audience, I'm sure you're all familiar with the paper in the American Economic Review way back in 2012. And that was titled, Measuring Economic Growth from Outer Space. So that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, so what we did for this particular sector assessment, uh, we assessed ADB support for transport over the years 2010 to 2018, and for this, Okay, for this we use nighttime luminosity data as a proxy for economic growth. Uh, you know, since 2012, a number of, number of uh, papers have been published, a number of organizations have used this approach. And so what you see on this slide is the location of 33 projects that were supported by ADB. And so we used nighttime luminosity data three years before the project and three years after the project. And what we found was based on our uh, results, what we found from our uh, analysis, um, about f nearly half the growth in those ADB supported regions could potentially be attributed uh, to the project specifically. And one thing you'll notice is you know, that what you're seeing in pink are the ADB supported projects. And you'll see that they're not in any specific country, right? So they're actually supranational in, in, in nature. And that's one of the advantages of using um, you know, data like geospatial data. You can actually go beyond country boundaries uh, to assess things like economic growth. Um, I'll stop here and hand it over to Sven, who'll walk you through um, what he has to share with you based on DVAL's work. Is this work? Oh, it's, oh, it's wow. working again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> it was working for a second. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, um, again, uh, as, I, as I said in the beginning, um, there are a couple of other sessions here talking about AI, which probably are, are going to go much more into depth and, and be much more technically sophisticated than what I'm, I'm going to show to you. Um, this is um, just an overview of what, what we as evaluators um, can do and the first question is not really what can we do but what to choose so those are all applications um, web services um, some of them are, are programs um, desktop applications that you can can download working on AI algorithms for different purposes and basically I mean this is a colleague of mine who put this together but but basically the answer is well you can do pretty much everything right you can Obviously, we all, well, who has used chat GPT? Can I show, see a show of hand? Okay, um, any other application like BART? Yeah, yeah, there are a few. Okay, so um, good colleagues. So you're, you're starting to, to work with this um, just as, as we are. So you can create poems, you can 
create pictures um, of your favorite cat uh, or your future cat or your past cat, what, whatever you, you want. Um, but you can also, I mean, you can create marketing strategies, right? You can have the strategy, you can have the logo, you can have the video that goes with it, um, you know, music that, that fits sort of your, your company profile, you know. Um, the, the, the range of stuff is, is pretty Im impressive. Um, but then, I mean, we're sort of in a, in a serious business uh, and, and not sort of paid for playing around with, with technology. So what is in for us? Um, I brought to you um, just four cases how we um, at the German Institute for Development Evaluation, I forgot to introduce myself, so we are Germany's official government institute to evaluate development cooperation. Um, so we have to be sort of quite careful what we use. Um, you know, Germany's privacy laws are, are, are strict um, and we, we have to be sort of, um, yeah, we can't just play around and, and, and do stuff at, at random as I guess is the case for, for all of you. Um, but um, what, um, what might be different if you're a student, right? And, and, uh, or, or my daughter, I'm sometimes afraid like how much of her homework she actually still does herself. Uh, anyway, um, but what, what we are doing now is, um, so in um, the pre-concept phase, when, when we're uh, thinking about potential evaluations, in the past it took us um, about a week of research assistant time to put together a dossier with basic information about um, a, a pro well, not a program, a, a strategy, right? So what does Germany do on climate change adaptation in, in Africa? And to what extent is that a possible subject for evaluation? So in, in the past, we had student researchers, assistants, uh, junior, junior staff putting together um, a file um, saying, okay, this is the, the evidence out there. Um, those are the, the evaluations that have been done by by esteemed colleagues like here in, in the in the room um, and those are potential evaluation questions so that we can then take it um, to our management team and then to to the board to discuss um, and now um, using um, chat GPT um, you know summarizing evidence and actually filtering for uh, publications uh, for evaluative evidence um, doesn't mean that we have the full product in, in the end, but um, I, would, I would say it saves us half of the time. So it's not that we, we just um, ask ChatGPT to come up with a, with a report, um, but um, it, it saves us, us some, some considerable time of, of research. Um, the, the other one um, is, uh, you know, um, Germans um, are fond of producing documents um, and, and our task is to evaluate Germany's development cooperation. Um, so they are all over the place and they're producing tons and tons of, of documents. So if you do a meta evaluation, for instance, um, we would typically look at more or less 500 evaluations done by GAZ, KFW. Uh, and in the past, actually I had a team who read through the evaluation reports of, of 500 evaluations. So now we still need to, to read quite, quite a lot, um, but we can, can use um, summarizing tools um, to point us um, to, the relevant, to the relevant places to find um, some of the needles in, in the hay, but probably not, not all. Um, but we can save uh, quite, quite some time, um, you know, finding our way in the jungle of tons and tons of, of documents. And the other one, um, which is it's maybe more fun, um, but um, for those of you working in government or international organizations, you know that um, sometimes our internal rules and, and regulations, um, they're like book size, right? At least in, in our case, um, our rules and, and regulations for the evaluation process. Um, so what do you have to do at the concept stage? Who do you have to consult? What is the process of before sending out a document to, to the ministry? You know, like what sort of quality assurance steps have to be taken? Who needs to be consulted? And so on and so forth. Um, there, I think it's like 120 pages. Um, just the process of quality assurance for, 
for our evaluations. Um, of course, you can make that more concise, and we have infographs and so on, but we, we're now implementing a chatbot uh, on our internal website where you say, okay, I'm at concept stage. Please tell me, uh, do I need to send the draft to the manager or to the team leader? So simple questions that we get all the time. We have an internal chatbot in, in progress that, that we're implementing. That's, that's quite safe because it's in sort of an um, isolated in environment, so nothing goes, goes out. Um, and again, it, it increases efficiency. The other one which, um, is, is quite, quite cool. Um, you can actually use also um, ChatGPT and, and others to summarize text from, from videos. Um, so the, the video that, that we just saw in, in the morning, um, you know, maybe there's a transcript, maybe, maybe not, maybe somebody is, is working on, on transcribing it, but um, you can actually also use um, ChatGPT or BART or, or others um, to have this transcript of the video. So if you're doing an, an evaluation, analyzing lots of video footage, um, you know, this, this is quite, quite helpful. It works the other way around as, as well, um, in my opinion, not, not that, that nicely, but it does. And last of all, for, for quality assurance. So um, I'm heading a department on evaluation methods. And um, you know, one of my tasks is to check for, for consistency. You know, when, they, when they talk about mixed method uh, in the evaluation report, they shouldn't be talking about just um, you know, two methods um, or switching to multi-method. You know, like simple, simple things that occur all, all the time. Um, and, and those consistency checks is, is one thing that you can do. But another one, um, for those of you who are more sort of on the, on the qualitative side of, of things, um, which is quite, quite interesting, you can actually take the results, for instance, of a regression analysis and ask, okay, this R square of 0.48, uh, what does it actually, actually mean, right? And then um, it will uh, help you to understand the findings from a regression analysis table. And then what, what some of my colleagues are, are using, um, they, they have their uh, stata syntax or R syntax being checked. Um, some try to, to have it written for them, that doesn't really work that, that well, but um, for those of you who've been working with, with stata, sometimes you know, you're, you're in your model and you just can't find the error, right? There, there's, something, there's something wrong. Um, and, and this is uh, actually a tool that, that works quite, quite well. Um, so in, in summary, um, for me, um, you know, it's, it's not sort of the, the magic bullet for, for ev evaluation at all. Um, and I don't think it will take away our jobs, but it will make some tasks that were quite cumbersome and, and tedious. It will make it more, more efficient. Um, and one, one point, because I'm running out of, of time, I would also like to, to emphasize, um, it will greatly increase access to, to knowledge. Um, so knowledge will become more, more available um, through those tools, and with that, um, I'll hand on to my esteemed colleague, Patricia. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. I'm just getting my head out of AI and all the things I'm going to be able to do. Um, and I just need to make sure I've got the clicker. Yeah, good. I'll and which one is it? This one. This one. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. Good. So what I've been working on, really my main focus for the past few years, has been um, the crisis that faces us, us all. So this is... Uh, something we should all worry about, the, the fact that nature is under attack and what that means. Um, and that's the threats from climate change, obviously, but also um, pollution, land use changes, which destroy forests and grassland and mangroves and kelp beds, over extraction of water, other resources, and invasive animal and plant species. So if you're reading uh, some newspapers, you'll notice this, they'll actually talk about this. It's a, it's, it is an existential crisis which faces us all. And if you're not familiar with it, then it's time to do some reading. Um, now, we know this, most of our governments acknowledge it, but evaluation is doing very little about this. We evaluate environmental programs, 
and that's great. But that's not enough because the damage that's being done is coming from our non-environmental programs and they get a clean a pass. And so we know that, you know, for example, agriculture and forestry and all sorts of things have environmental impacts. All of them have environmental impacts. And if evaluation is not being part of the solution, if it's not helping us to make the changes we need to the world, we're part of the problem and we're complicit in the destruction. Um, and so people sometimes go, well, you know, I don't care that much about trees or I care more about people and little endangered frogs. And that's not the really where we are. Um, I like this diagram of the Sustainable Development Goals. It sums it up. It's sometimes called the wedding cake. It's sort of layers, right? But it says, well, we care about people and, and the social outcomes. Um, and we care about the economic outcomes that support that. But we have to care about the natural resource base because everything depends on that. And if we keep destroying that, we're not going to reach the other things. And it's not a matter of saying, oh, we need to deal with poverty and then we'll start to look at the environment. If we don't deal with climate change and the other environmental ones, we're going to have increased poverty, hunger, war. Oh, you know, th this is where we are. And it's very frustrating to look at evaluation and just for us to be absent. So uh, a few years ago, um, Andy Rowe, who's a Canadian evaluator, came out to the Australian Evaluation Conference and Dugan was also there. So he, Dugan was talking passionately about people and making a difference for people. Andy was talking passionately about the need to protect the environment. And we started saying, how do we do this? Because it's a huge challenge. We can't double the size of all our evaluations to say, and now we'll do an environmental evaluation. That's not feasible. We don't want to just put a few little indicators on it, like greenwashing. Oh, yes, and we recycle our post-it notes. Tick, right? So how do you do it? And so we, uh, this became our lockdown project. So with Dugan, Andy, Jane Davidson and I started, and then we've been joined by Kay Stevens and Alice McFarlane, talking this through, how do we do this? All right, and so it's been a mix of bringing in, translating some to some methods, some bricolage, putting them together, some systematisation where Andy would say, well, here's how I'd go about it, and we'd basically document what's going on, what's he doing, all right, and starting to put that together. So this became sort of a footprint evaluation initiative, and we're, we're labelling this now sustainability in inclusive evaluation. How do we embed environmental sustainability in all our evaluations. Right, we started with some thought experiments. So Dugan brought in one about the child support grant. What's the environmental implications of that? Jane brought in a community development project that she'd been involved in. And I thought, I know one that's gonna be, not have any environmental ones. And it was a prison, it was a corrections program that was trying to divert people from going to prison. And I said, oh, that's got no environmental ones. You know, it had a project officer. Well, should they be in an e-vehicle or what, you know, what's the, what's the environmental ones? And what Andy said is, go to the outcomes. If this works, you won't have to build as many prisons, right? And prisons have huge negative environmental impacts. So this program that we thought was um, all about social outcomes, if it succeeded, was actually going to be environmentally beneficial, all right? So that was a huge wake up to me, to, that you could do it, it's feasible, and it's useful. So, just to speak uh, uh, briefly about the steps. Right. Um, we're thinking about it in these sort of terms. First of all, obviously, you have to get it on the agenda for evaluation and uh, before you can actually do it. And for some organisations, it's already there. There's something about cross-cutting environmental issues or there's some recognition of it. Um, in South Africa, the government has just released a new criteria for evaluation on ecosystems health, so that all evaluations of government programs, at national ones, have to consider it. So that's a way to get it on the agenda. And then you've got to engage your relevant interests and knowledges about natural systems. Now, most evaluations identify and engage stakeholders. This goes more broadly to interests related to natural systems. It does a bigger sweep in terms of the knowledge that you might bring in. That might be scientific knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, so that you can know the place uh, where this is going to occur. Um, the theory of change for your program needs to be expanded. 
to include natural systems. How might the activities of what you're doing impact it? How might the outcomes, like the prison example, impact the natural systems? And do you need to change the spatial, the space of, of where you're considering it? Maybe the impacts are going to be downstream or, or more broader. Maybe they'll be in a different time frame. So you can end up with this huge shopping list, that's impossible. So then we're finding you've got to focus on a few key issues. So this is not about saying we're going to identify every possible environmental impact and then we're going to measure it, we're going to add it all up, right? You know, there we have urgency, we have to do uh, a good enough job soon enough. So focus on a few key issues and make maximum use of existing evidence, make it feasible. And there's actually often a lot of information about natural systems that is accessible. Uh, Maya was talking about geospatial information, for example, that a lot of that can be brought in. Uh, there's a lot of existing information that is relevant to what you're doing. And then we need to draw the, some explicit evaluative conclusions. And this is uh, uh, this one, which was first developed, Nancy can talk more about it, this man here, just want to just give a wave. If you want to talk more about the first case where this was used, this is the man to talk to. Uh, uh, so this is about having a scale. I mean, and down the bottom is where it's obviously destructive and there's no, no thought given to reducing the harm. The sustainability aware is where a lot of programs are. They've, they're taking steps to reduce the harm, which is good, but it's not enough. Then they often are, people are aiming for no net harm, that you, you eliminate harms or you have genuine offsets to balance them out. But we actually need to move to restorative. I mean, our natural systems are in such a state, we have to be restoring it. So the bar is a lot higher. Right? So, and, this, and Nancy can talk about the pushback within EFAD, that people are a bit upset about this, you know, that they were doing a lot of good things, but a lot of them were at the sustainability aware and to say, that's good, but we need to do more. All right. And then, um, obviously, you need to support people to use this information. We're really keen to see people do this early. It's no point coming along after a seven-year program and saying, well, that was really damaging. Right? You need to have this up front early on in the design, in the planning, in the implementation, in the managing, so that those problems, you know, the risks are identified, mitigated, monitored. All right. So what might this look like in practice? This is a little s snippet out of um, some work we did with the Uganda, um, the midterm review of Uganda's national private sector development strategy. So they had environment in their terms of reference as a cross-cutting issue, but it wasn't really clear where that was going to fit in. And uh, working with uh, uh, Dugan and the, the members of that team, um, we proposed how we might go about that and it was really going back to the OECD DAC criteria. If you haven't read the guidance on that recently, I do highly recommend it. It's mo very illuminating. Um, we in this one really just looked at it in terms of three of them. The coherence, how well did this private, developments, private sector development strategy uh, match with their national development plan, which talked about environmental things. How did it connect with their green growth strategy? You know, how, how coherent was it? Um, and we also talked about sustainability in the DAC criteria, which is about the durability of outcomes. But a big focus was about impact, and the OECD DAC criteria don't just talk about did you meet your objectives. It's very clearly about intended and unintended, positive and negative. They explicitly talk about environmental impacts. And so if you're using the OECD DAC criteria, you need to be including environmental sustainability. And we, uh, we were massively constrained in this evaluation in terms of our access to people and data and, and evidence. But even so, we were able to identify relevant evidence that said, um, these potential negative environmental impacts haven't been identified and addressed in the strategy, um, even when they're known. So, for example, there'd been environmental impact statements done for new industrial parks that said, we need, here are the risks, here's how we need to manage them. 
Um, and then once they were implemented, that wasn't, it was never referred to again. We said, well, you need to be, uh, have a strategy to manage those risks, you need to monitor whether there's compliance with those strategies, and you need to monitor whether they're being successful. So this evaluation, which was very constrained, was found to be useful. They're, they've used that to re refine their strategy. They're looking at using it in their future evaluations. So it's something which can add value and can be feasible. We have a lot of other information which you'll find um, on the Better Evaluation Knowledge Plat. It's the knowledge platform of the Global Evaluation Initiative. And the thing, um, we have examples, we have the Uganda case, we have some tools, um, getting generic key evaluation questions, how to, how to use the DAC criteria. And the thing that's very hot off the press, that left-hand one, sustainability inclusive evaluation, why we need it and how to do it, that's version one. Uh, it was published yesterday, very, very fresh off the press, so very keen to get your feedback on that. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, just to remind you, my name is Dugan. I work with the Global Evaluation Initiative. And I want to start by congratulating Manny and his team on this amazing event. Um, this is really an example of building a system, of creating a community and growing this evaluation field. And I think it's a really substantial and important contribution to be able to hold events like this. One of the things that the Global Evaluation Initiative does is we work to strengthen national, country-level monitoring and evaluation systems. And in doing that, we use a particular tool that we developed. I'm going to keep using different mechanisms so that you can still hear me. One of the things we do is we undertake a, a, an, an analytical exercise called a Monitoring and Evaluation Systems Analysis, a MISA. The MISA tool is being used to help countries understand their own evidence ecosystems better. We're in, in the process of undertaking one in Bhutan. We've done one in Solomon Island. Cook Islands is doing their own. It's okay, I'm irrepressible. <laughs> Cook Islands is doing one themselves using our tool. Some of the Indian states are doing them. And what that tool does is it allows you to look at different dimensions of a country's monitoring and evaluation ecosystem or evidence system. We look at the traditions, the practices, the culture. We look at media. We look at the role of higher education institutions. We look at civil society, development partners. We look at the practices and traditions that are prevalent in that country. And then, of course, obviously, we look very closely at the state. When we look at the state, we look particularly at the institutions at the center of government. We're particularly interested in national planning commissions, but also ministries of finance, uh, presidencies and prime minister's offices. In some instances where the MISA tool is being used, people are also looking subnationally, so they're looking at particular provinces, they're looking at governor's offices. And in Recife, in Brazil, our center there is looking at the city and trying to understand how the city does monitoring and evaluation. And essentially what we're doing here is not something new, it's not novel, but it's a case of pulling together existing knowledge and packaging it in a way that allows people to make sense of a particular situation. And what's been so incredibly satisfying is to see people who've worked in an ecosystem for decades suddenly coming to understand the system in a way that they hadn't previously. And this is a case of people coming together and sharing insights and suddenly talking about something in a way that casts fresh light on it. And it's very empowering for those people to suddenly realize the extent to which, for example, they generate enormous amounts of evidence, but it's not shared properly with the budget office or the Ministry of Finance. And as a result, the decision making that should have been improved through that evidence generation isn't happening. And so now, for example, one of our big areas of focus is on trying to make sure that evidence gets fed into resource allocation deliberations. So this is a case of the GEI trying to bring a systems thinking approach into efforts to build monitoring and evaluation systems. A second thing we're doing, <coughs> and this arises from our work with the OECD's COVID coalition project, is we've undertaken a number of uh, country-led evaluations jointly with those countries. 
And this is part of our efforts to, cre to create experiential learning among countries. And I think so far, the people who have learned the most from this experience have definitely been us. We're working in Malawi, in Burkina Faso, and in Ghana. And the process has been incredibly rewarding and educative for us. <laughs> you know, often when you do capacity building, the idea is that you're building somebody else's capacity. When in fact, I think often when you do capacity building, it's your own capacity that gets built. And so this work, particularly the work in Malawi, where there's been a lot of evaluation done by development partners, but little evaluation done by government, we are both on such an amazing, incredibly rich learning journey, both us as the GEI and the World Bank Country Office who are supporting the evaluation, and then the, the, the Ministry of Development Planning that is learning so much about this, uh, this cash transfer program that operated during COVID. And we have a similar exercise about to take off in, uh, in, in Ghana. The Burkina Faso project is also going well, but I think, as you all know, there's, there's been a lot of turmoil in West Africa. So this experience of, of learning by doing is, for us, uh, a real innovation. We are learning, our partner is learning, and capacity is being strengthened. And, and it's been a very rewarding exercise. When we think about building monitoring and evaluation systems, the GEI has a model that says we need to operate at a whole range of different levels. We need to build a coalition of people who are interested in strengthening the evidence ecosystem. And there are a number of different interventions that we implement at the country level through our partners. I just want to remind you who our partners are because oftentimes it's a bit of a confusing ecosystem that we run. We work with the six clear centers, centers for learning on evaluation and results. We also finance the IPDET program, which happens in Switzerland every year and has an online program throughout the year. We run the Better Evaluation Knowledge Platform, and we also host the annual Global Evaluation Week. So what the GEI is trying to do is to have a multi-level intervention that works at a country level by firstly shifting norms. And so what we're trying to do is to make monitoring and evaluation part of a standard public sector reform program that any country that is seeking to improve their governance treats evaluation and monitoring as elements that require dedicated, focused attention. And that is itself an exercise. You know, when you focus on something, when you have an engagement around it, when you build a partnership with people, that thing takes on a life and it gains momentum. And we're finding that very, very much to be the case. In countries that are really pressed with many, many challenges, by creating opportunities for people to talk about monitoring and evaluation capacity development, we're finding it becomes a focus and adds value. The second thing we do <coughs> is we're strengthening institutions. We believe very strongly that institutions have a key role to play in generating evidence. And so our work in strengthening institutions has got a range of different dimensions. Obviously, it's got a big focus on training, because training is the one thing everybody knows, and you know many of the people we work with are public servants. Public servants are very committed to enhancing their skill sets, usually, especially if it comes with a certificate. Uh, <coughs> but that's another element, is building stronger institutions that are able to participate in these processes on a sustained basis in a way that generates returns to them. If an institution gets better at what it's doing, they're going to have more incentives to participate in that system. And the third layer to our model is to be thinking about individuals. I don't know if you, you, you may see that there's a lot of focus in the GEI on our social media presence. We do a lot of work on keeping evaluation on the agenda, to be thinking about building capacity, and to be making it a conversation that is treated as part of what you do if you're involved in development in the 21st century. If you do development in the 21st century, you've got to be thinking about how you produce and use evidence, whether it's from evaluative studies or through monitoring and reporting. But one thing is for sure, 
If you are unable to make sense of what's happening in your society, you can't manage it. And so this is something we emphasize considerably. Innovation for us is about a whole range of different things. It's about using existing knowledge differently. It's about using different knowledge in other places. It's about seeking novelty and new things. But more than anything, for us, innovation is to be very decidedly and unashamedly part of an effort to build a global community of evaluators. We believe that evaluation has got the most profound potential, but that it doesn't realize it because it remains, I would argue, not focused on building itself as a field. And I think that one of the things we do here through these gatherings is we take this field forward. And that has to be partly innovation, but also it's just good old fashioned relationships. And that's something I think we really prioritize as well. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand over to you, Andrea. Wow, colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> these are uh, really engaging and I'd say inspiring uh, talks that you've, uh, you've got here. I, I hope everyone is still alive um, after this round of four or five presentations that we've had. Um, I might steal this from you. I, um, I was here to, I was asked to come here to talk about knowledge. And um, at first I was a little bit um, bamboozled by this uh, kind request, but uh, I, I thought I'm, I, I give it a try. And I realized as I walked through the, the history of the GCF that uh, we're very much uh, in the business of knowledge brokery and, and, and knowledge management. And I'll, I'll, I want to enlighten you with some of these stories just, uh, just now in three slides, so, so colleagues, it, it won't, won't take that long. But let me, let me tell you, um, the GCF, and, and in particular the independent evaluation of the GCF, uh, are a very young organization. We're still calling ourselves, uh, we, we're still catching ourselves in this age of, uh, of a startup I in the climate space. And with that, um, um, the Independent Evaluation Unit was only established in, in, in uh, mid-2017. Uh, with that, we were faced by a couple of challenges that were also being seen as, as opportunities. And let me, let me briefly talk about uh, these challenges. One is, th the first challenge is, uh, if it's a young organization, it obviously has got a very young portfolio. So we've had very little to work with as evaluators if we wanted to look backwards to see what we are doing right and what we may not be doing right and where we could improve. Um, second to this was also we were finding ourselves in an, in an organization that was still establishing its policy landscape and that was still discussing on how can we uh, bring impact to, to the discussion uh, in, in management as well as in the operational end of, of the fund. The opportunity with that was we, we, and we found this in particular interesting as evaluators, the opportunity they had with this was we could look at building an approach that would build trust from the beginning. And I think that's uh, something that we've heard as well yesterday. It's very important to think about how can we as evaluators not come across only for the, 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 um, the, the colleagues that build accountability, but also for other aspects that are, that are important to the operations and to the fund. Um, uh, overall. So for us, this question of building trust, as well as uh, coupled with this question of having a new area, a new space where in which we would do evaluations, the climate space, uh, it, it was very interesting to see how we could put our best foot forward uh, in the conversation institutionally. And that's, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to uh, share that with you. We've been really, really fortunate to bring about an evaluation policy that took about three years in the development, but was finally recognized in 2021 uh, through the approval by the board that, that, that basically lends itself to this conversation, to this question. And the evaluation policy described evaluations through three functions. And you see them here on the, on the right hand side. So first, we were still saying evaluations should think and focus about accountability. But at the same time, uh, they should also think about how can we help the organization to learn. The GCF is a learning organization, as it is, describes itself as a learning organization in the governing instrument, was very much 
a, a new kid on the block to, to really think about what can we do and how can we learn and how can we use this learning to improve ourselves while, while, we, while we're building this institution. The third uh, function that we, that we attributed to at evaluations was the dialogue function. Because we felt that learning, uh, and it's, it's very often said, learning is, is not enough. You can't just bring the learning, the evidence, and the knowledge to the table. You need to think about the dialogue that you need to unleash with that learning that you've got in order to, uh, to improve. So in a, in a way, um, for, for such a new uh, institution, and perhaps also for older institutions, it's always good to think about how can we set a culture of evaluations. And we translated this into three things. Those are also basically those three bullets. We said, okay, we need to be putting forward trusted evidence. We need to make the organization trust in, in evidence, in rigorous evidence that we can bring forward in, in the climate space. Second, we need to help the organization to use this evidence for decision making. So we need to inform the decision making uh, uh, in, in the fund. And lastly, we need to have a conversation about impact based on the knowledge that we've got. Uh, and th that's, uh, that's essentially uh, uh, wh what we've been trying here. And after three years uh, of, of developing this policy, I'm, I'm, I think we, we, we set the tone right with the organization to, do to go that way. And in the second slide, I just want to tell you a little bit about how we started. So as, we, as I said, we found ourselves in an organization that was very young and that wanted to leapfrog from some of the learnings that other organizations had done previously. We also found ourselves in a, in a space where climate was, was relatively unknown to the evaluation space. We know that the Jeff looked at environment and still looks at the environment function and the question of environment, but that was obviously a very different conversation compared to, to, to the climate one. And I, I believe to some extent you've seen this as well with this lovely diagram that it's been, that's been shown by, by Patricia. Uh, interestingly here, um, we, um, we, we, we learned very quickly, and this is the title to the slide, that if we want to learn, we, uh, and, and if we want to be evidence-based, we need to do this in a collaborative manner, and we need to have collaborative ev uh, ev ev evidence synthesis. Uh, we felt that that was the best foot forward to look at what is globally out there, what do we know globally, how should the fund act in this global uh, environment, how can we inform both the operations but as well the board and the leadership about what works, for whom, uh, uh, and how. And what we did then is, we and money will notice from Free IE, we, we looked a lot at the, the question of evidence synthesis, evidence gap maps, and meta-analysis of the knowledge that's out there globally. Um, to remove what we knew from traditional reviews was the biases, the bias that we have for selection bias, publication bias, a couple of other biases that we see with the individual impact studies that are out there in certain programs, in certain contexts. So we looked at systematic maps, at evidence gap maps, to present to the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the different stakeholders of the organization in a very visually attractive uh, way an overview of the existing uh, systematic reviews, the existing impact evaluations uh, on the type of interventions and the type of outcomes that, that the fund was after. And through that, we found this to be a very good approach and a very uh, valid approach to enter into that dialogue, into that conversation about learning with both the operations part and, and the management. I've seen the card. On the, uh, on the right hand side, you on the lower right end, you see an example for an evidence gap map. So basically an evidence gap map is a very pithy way of saying, what do we know in, in the different cells on, on, the, on the left hand side from, from the intervention space to the outcome space? What do we know? What are, what are studies, impact studies or synth uh, systematic uh, reviews out there that can inform us about what works and what doesn't? What you also see is you see gaps. That certain areas, we still couldn't find anything. And I'll make an example. The example is, in 2019, we looked at climate change adaptation. We realized that the fund wanted to have a new approach to climate change adaptation and wanted to foster its conceptual ideas around, around that area. So we said, okay, let's do an in, in, in evidence gap map and an evidence review uh, in that area. And at first, we, was, we, we, were, we were saying it's, it's quite easy to do. Let's, let's just go ahead. Let's, let's have a look at the, at the evidence, at the literature. We went through the web of science. 
we went through gray, gray literature, and what we found was actually astonishing. Before 2008, there was near to no study that would talk about the term climate change or climate change adaptation. And that was quite a revelation for us in 2019. So we only looked at an, an evidence base of 10 years. But what we saw is that as we moved on from 2008, we saw a, a massive increase in, in, in evidence and in literature and in, 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 in articles out there that would discuss impact in climate change adaptation. So we, we, we found about 13,000 studies that were very much scattered all across um, uh, a system that we were building at the time. Uh, when we then looked at, through the evidence review and uh, through the evidence gap map and the review, we found that there's also very drastic geographic differences. There's very uh, strong knowledge on what works and how in sub-Saharan African studies, and there's very little knowledge about climate change adaptation in, in Latin America. We also found ver various differences in sectors. So agricultural sector was very well known, very well researched. The water sector uh, and land-based uh, ecosystems, there was very little uh, 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 evidence out there to tell us what works uh, and how. Um, interestingly enough, we also wanted to uh, provide uh, the GCF at the time, the Green Climate Fund at the time, a better understanding of how that could be used. So we overlaid this with where the funds are currently going from the GCF as well as from, from, from bilateral donors, just to see a little bit what globally has been done about these fields. So to, to help the, uh, the organization to see, do we want to prioritize areas where we have a lot of evidence on impact, or do we want to go in areas where we have very little, where we might be bringing new innovations, new uh, understandings to the table? So my, so my last slide is basically, uh, one minute, oh gosh. Okay, wh wh what do we know with this? And uh, I'll be very quick here. So uh, importantly here uh, to say is that we, we, we did this to help our own evaluations due to the lack of portfolio. We looked at those evidence reviews and evidence gap maps to be able to guide and be a little bit more forward looking in our, uh, in our, in our um, feedback to the secretariat, to the management, about areas such as climate, thematic areas such as uh, climate change adaptation, but also strategic evaluations in, in country ownership and, and, and other questions. The, the next thing, it was also a, co a communication starter. It was a starter to have that dialogue about knowledge, to make that linkage that you've been speaking about on, on saying we, we, we cannot only learn, we also need to, need to get people to the table in the countries as well as in the institution to talk with us about their experiences to build, to build better. And, and that was basically done at three levels. So we were able to code, uh, we were able to help management to co-develop better programs, looking at replication and scaling. We, we looked at improving impact evaluations going in, in the beginning of a project to say, we need to do, we need to prepare for impact evaluations. We know this works, this doesn't, let's do this together. And we also were able to look and discuss the policy directions that a fund may want to take at a at time. I'll keep it at that because it was only a minute. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, colleagues. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. And this one is not working. This one is working. Great. Um, so, colleagues, um, we've got about 30 minutes uh, for, for question and, and answers um, before we, we get to this. Um, so I hope this was um, uh, at least this, this first sort of uh, presentation a bit was, uh, was interesting and, and useful for for you um you know the the connecting thread what what um we're trying to to communicate here is that um you know we're we're taking oftentimes we're taking existing methods ex existing tools partnerships knowledge to build on on that um and um uh, it's not i mean and the part of the reason of this this panel is for me personally because at so many evaluation conferences, is you've got people standing up and, and presenting the most fancy innovation uh, in evaluation. And so um, here, I think we're, we're a bit more, more, more modest, but uh, what, what, um, at least from listening to, to the panelists, I mean, um, there's some, some really amazing experiences. I mean, Patricia's whole new way of, and Andy's and, 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 and Dugan's and, and colleagues, new way of, of thinking about integrating 
the big issue of the climate crisis in our, our work to make it even more relevant, working with geospatial data in the COVID crisis. Uh, I mean, and, and, and Dugan's um, GEI partnership, for, for me, what you didn't say is, is actually, I mean, what is really um, innovative <laughs> is that the, the partnership, the GEI in itself, I mean, within that you're doing lots of cool things, but, but the, the, the Global Evaluation Initiative as, uh, as an animal as, as such is, um, is a really cool, uh, cool thing. And, and Andreas, of course, I mean, your, your work on, uh, and you've done much, much more on, on synthesizing evidence, uh, identifying, um, is, is so Im important because oftentimes we just do evaluations uh, and generate more evidence and we forget about how much is, is out there. So without uh, further ado, can I see a show of hands for comments, questions, critique? There's a gentleman over there. Now I think we monopolized all the, the mics here. Please go ahead. And um, um, please identify yourself and if possible, uh, direct the question to, to one of the, the colleagues, if that's possible. Thank you. Good morning. Very enlightening discussion, in fact. I'm uh, Ibrahim, Assistant Auditor General at the SAI Maldives, pre Maldives Institution of the Maldives. I'm just wondering, um, I don't know whom to actually target the question, but from amongst the uh, five, in fact, uh, any one of you can take up. Um, I'm just wondering how far you uh, have used data analytics and data mining for evaluation, yeah? Okay, great, great question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll collect if there's some, some other questions. Yes, the lady over here, just next, just here in front, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am from Mongolia and then working uh, the authority of the government supervisor as the head of the monitoring and evaluation. I have a sort of question, especially from the Dugan and then uh, in a national level uh, to developing the national M &E system uh, f from the parliament, from the government, from the president, which organization is hosting most influential in a national level? And also to use the <laughs> evidence and then how to, you know, more influential to use it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and um, one more here in the room, and we've got one online as well. Thank you so much. My name is Douglas Glandon from 3IE, and uh, I have a few sort of common uh, questions. First is uh, for Sven. Uh, very exciting to see that you're testing out all of these different AI-related applications. Um, and I really liked your comment about the importance of checking uh, these things. Um, and so I guess the comment sort of is a reflection from our own experience doing some of this for the group, and then maybe you'll elaborate uh, as well. Uh, I was at uh, a presentation on the use of things like ChatGPT for informing work, and uh, a presenter who had worked on this for about a year uh, made a really good suggestion that was treat ChatGPT like an intern, which I think is sort of what you were referring to, which means uh, first draft and make sure to check everything because it might be wrong. And I think that's especially true if you're interested in looking for references because it can completely fabricate references. Um, it's just predicting what is likely to be the next word based on the corpus that it's drawing from. So it's not actually knowing anything, it's just predicting based on uh, all of the content that it has access to. Um, another thing maybe you'll, you'll comment on as well um, is the idea of using a structured prompt to inform the kind of output you get. So there's a lot of flexibility you have for asking in, in these first draft, draft zero, draft 0 0.1 documents, um, include this kind of content in section one and then this in section two, this in section three, um, you can even ask for it to uh, present it in a certain kind of tone. Um, and the Microsoft Bing sidebar allows you to refer to content that is directly in uh, a URL that's specified and you can also um, set uh, the sort of 
the tone for whether it's going to be more creative or more precise. Uh, and thankfully, when it's more precise, it's more likely to tell you, I, I, I don't have the answer for you, uh, which is a little bit reassuring. Uh, and then on the privacy, uh, oh, so I'll, pu I'll put interpretation for regression models, interpreting R squared. That very, very helpful. Um, but also if you're complex or if, if your regression model is very complex, it also might uh, get it wrong uh, because there's not a lot of information out there on some of the complex regression models you might be running. Um, and if you are going to use uh, one of these large language models for your own work, just be aware that if you're sending information to chat GPT, that is not private anymore. So don't send any private um, interview related information uh, into that. I'm sure you've been. Uh, having more guidance on that, uh, Sven. And then uh, for Maya, I love the example of using geospatial data for looking at counterfactuals and doing retrospective impact evaluation. I think that should be done a lot more uh, and uh, or at least looked into as, a, as an option a lot more. Um, and as a word from experience, word of caution uh, for everyone in the room, if that's something you're interested in, um, one thing we've seen is that there is also a temptation, including during the COVID time, to use remotely sensed data as the exclusive source of information to do impact evaluations, sometimes to the exclusion of on the ground data collection and engagement with local stakeholders, which would be problematic uh, for a variety of reasons. As we all know, sometimes interventions don't get implemented in the way uh, that they were planned. Uh, so, not a substitute, but a complement. Um, and then, uh, lastly, uh, Andreas, love to see the evidence gap map. And uh, just a note for colleagues who are interested in evidence gap maps, the 3IE website has uh, 36 on a variety of different topics and uh, over a thousand systematic reviews. Uh, thank you all. I love the presentations. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so um, let's let's try to to get back with with some answers. Um, have you been been working with data mining, Maya? No, uh, but then perhaps you can can start with the um, uh, uh, with the comments on on the geospatial um, analysis. Yeah. Okay. So on geospatial analysis, yes, absolutely. I think it's a cost-effective way of getting, I'd say, some rough estimates. Uh, but I'd say even for the transport sector evaluation, we also correlated that with some uh, EIRR estimates. So you know that's sort of one source. And I think it's particularly useful when you're covering a really wide geographic area. And there's really no cost-effective or realistic way of gathering the data that you need from every single one of those interventions. Like the example I showed you, it's a sector-wide look at a fairly large geographic area, and I think trying to get uh, data, I think, from all of those, all of those places is going to be close to impossible. I mean, you'd have to spend a whole lot of money and time uh, to be able to do what you can get. You, you can get a pretty rough estimate, I'd say. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't want to hang your hat on that, uh, but I think it gives you directionally at least, you know, whether things have improved, whether they've become worse. Um, so I think they do give you some good information in a very cost-effective way. So we still have the one on, on data, data mining, colleagues, Andreas, yeah? yeah. Um, th thanks for the question, again, on, on data mining. Um, from the perspective of the GCF, uh, we, we've tried to do that to uh, help um, put information into machine-readable format. So it's been very helpful um, with the absence of data systems at the GCF in the early days. We, we had to resource to some uh, uh, methods uh, in, in, the data, in the data mining space to, to basically set up our own um, evaluation data. Um, and we use that to, to extract information from, from the uh, funding proposals uh, and other information, the, the term sheets, the financial sheets of, of projects that we had at the time. We, we're still using this today. Um, and, and actually, it, it's been quite interesting because we're building, so to speak, a, an own data system next to the operational data system of the organization. Um, with, with, you know, and we're trying to always communicate and explain that 
that this is very different data because you need to be very careful when you work with data and look at the metadata that you've got to say, okay, these indicators that you're collecting have been collected with a certain purpose in mind, with a certain scope in mind for an evaluation. And they might not be easily transferable from one to another evaluation or to, to operations. So it's uh, to operations of the fund and, and, and of the, the, project, um, the project teams. So th that's been an interesting insight from our end. And we, we're still using it until data systems would allow us to, to use uh, uh, or, or to use data in, in machine-readable machine readable format. Thanks. Okay. Patricia? Yeah, and then Dugan, um, a really interesting question on um, institutions hosting um, and the use of, of evidence. One of the things we, thank you very much for the question, which is a question that arises often. Um, and one of, the quest one of the reasons it comes up is because in many institutions there is in fact a political tension around a whole lot of different things. And so the evaluation dynamic um, emerges in countries uh, where there's often a, a strong contestation between the executive, the, the administration, and the legislature or, or parliament. And we don't have a standard response to this. We, we really believe that this is an issue for the country to resolve. And so in, in certain places, um, I think it would probably be indiscreet of me to mention country names, but what we find is that we really encourage every institution to have an evaluative function, either dedicated or integrated elsewhere. But the question really arises, who is the custodian of evaluation for that national system? So who is going to play the lead role? I think for the most part, we don't really see that as a, as a function for a parliament or a legislature. But, you know, legislatures are very different depending on where they are. And in some countries, it, do, it does make sense and it would be appropriate. But I can't imagine there being a, an administration, an executive, that doesn't have a big role to play in evaluation. And the reason for that, ultimately, is that one of the core responsibilities of an executive is to be making resource allocation decisions. And evaluative evidence should really inform that process. And so while they may not be the ultimate custodian or the owner of an evaluation system, they definitely need to play a big role, they need to be a major user, and they need to make sure that it meets their needs, that the evaluation system is fit for that purpose. But at the same time, parliamentarians are increasingly playing a role in evaluation, particularly in this region. You know, the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association has got a very active engagement with parliamentarians, and this is kind of the whole drive to mainstream evaluative thinking, so that people are able to use data to articulate what they base their decisions on, to set up frameworks that allow you to point to how you came to a particular policy conclusion. And so we don't see evaluation as something that you want to treat as a precious jewel that only a single entity can own. It's something we want to see broader and more widely used, and of course, it needs to interplay dynamically with a monitoring system. You know, monitoring and evaluation are different sides of the same coin, although they do slightly different things. You know, I can see Sven's getting twitchy, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, to, to the colleague from, from 3IE, I um, agree with, with all of that. And for the sake of time, I mean, um, we can take it offline or, or please please approach me. But I think this, um, what, what um, your, your colleague um, or the, the presenter said, um, treat, um, treat chat GPT or BART as, as an intern. I, I would say probably as a junior researcher. Uh, I think they're, they're getting better than um, some, some interns, but some interns are really, really good. Um, but, but check, that's, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. And for more sophisticated models, yeah. Uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't always work, but I mean, if you see sort of the the progression from GPT three to to four, I mean, I guess by the time sort of 
we got our heads around how to deal with, with privacy, with how to, to use it in, in our own um, institutional spaces, uh, have some maybe some some internal regulations on how to use this and, and what to, to avoid. Most of that is, is common sense. But by the time in, in most of our organizations that we get to the point of using it, I, I would guess it's it's so good then. Um, uh, it will do a lot of things, and and you can do as you as you said, you know, some some meta prompts. So uh, you can you can tweak and and say, well, if you're not uh, sure, don't don't give an answer. That helps um, a bit. Um, or you can you can also for the paid versions, um, you know, you can can upload your your own text. You can um, pinpoint specific websites. So there there's actually a, a German pilot working. With, with your website, uh, with, with 3IE, and, and say, well, just uh, extract information from, from 3IE's website. So by, by that, you can sort of uh, reduce the, the scope for error. But the, the big point, point really is, I mean, no confidential information um, barred by, by Google. I'm not being paid by, by Google, but since sort of um, talking about ChatGPT, but there's, there's also um, barred with an, with an D. Um, that can be in, installed and, and used a bit more um, in, a, in a data privacy uh, safer-ish uh, way. Um, and you can sort of uncheck that, that it, it, it's been used for learning. Um, so, but, but still, you know, please be, be very, very careful with, with that. Um, okay, any more questions? Oh, yeah, th uh, sorry. There was one question on, online, um, which is really cool which is about how to evaluate innovation. So we've been talking about innovations, but how to evaluate um, uh, innovation. So, and Patricia, maybe you want to start. Sure, yeah. I, f I mean, for me, it's the two things. Is it, uh, is it feasible? Can we do it? Can we actually make it work without chewing up lots of resources? And then is it useful? You know, is it, is it harmful like chat G GPT? If you're exposing confidential information, that's that's not useful. Um, that's a, that's a problem, is it? So you know, t you do a cost-benefit analysis, but not in a dollars way. I think. Yeah. Really brief. Uh, Anyone want to Good morning. Uh, my name is Yertin Chimek. I'm still okay. Good morning. My name is Yertin Chimek. I am a founder and president of Mongolian Evaluation Association. Uh, to me, it seems like a dream comes true to see all the giants of uh, evaluation, Patricia <laughs> uh, and Dugan. <coughs> and many other people whom we uh, watched over Zoom many years, especially after COVID, right? So um, uh, I would like to uh, share two comments and one question. So uh, I think COVID brought a lot of innovation to, uh, to the evaluation field because uh, our association was born uh, in 2021, two years ago. And uh, how it came to birth is we uh, watched all your videos, YouTube, webinars, and you were putting all the resources available. So I remember watching better evaluation, and you can become footprint evaluation. So just experiencing how you uh, really adapt into the change, fitting for purpose, especially during this climate change. So it was so great. And now uh, looking at footprint evaluation, so we would like to be our uh, we have one of our mem uh, CEO of the evaluation. She is a climate change person, so we just look forward to learning more. But if if I may request uh, uh, make a request to Patricia, maybe maybe uh, making uh, some um, self-paced training how we do the footprint evaluation. We know you have a, a monthly monthly webinar on footprint, but we would like to learn more how we do the footprint. And with uh, Dugan, uh, so we uh, discovered MISA from, uh, from website. And what we really like is you give a uh, room for us to tailor-made. Because you say it's uh, for developing countries, but each country can tailor-made based on our context. So I think that's innovation itself. 
And the question for the IED Maya. Uh, so you showed the proxy, uh, light time proxy, uh, light time tr uh, uh, night time light as a proxy for economic growth and we see Mongolia as dark, right? So, <laughs> uh, because we have huge land and a very sparse population, so it's okay that we look dark. However, <laughs> when it comes to social media, I think we are number one in uh, Facebook user in the, in the Asia, Asia Pacific uh, region and also even in the world. So I was wondering like, from each of the speakers if you had any uh, some um, during the COVID or after COVID, you used social media as a tool for evaluation because I think there's a lot of potential to use social media in evaluation, especially the country like Mongolia. So thank you very much. We, we, we didn't coordinate. Um, we just all <laughs> sat together. Uh, Jeff Chelsky um, from uh, Independent Evaluation Group at the World Bank. Um, I wanted to pick up on part of what Doug said um, on AI, and it's not the privacy side. It's the, uh, the fact that, that numbers are not facts and words are not truth. Um, and there's a lot of euphoria around uh, uh, chat GPT, and I would actually argue more broadly whether or not we're talking text analytics, econ econometrics, um, and there's an illusion of rigor in using a lot of these tools. Um, in my office, um, I sort of have the reputation as being the guy who shows up at the party and asks them to turn down the music, um, because I think these are all very, very, very powerful tools, but we don't talk enough about their limitations. And um, I spent an entire day, um, IG had a whole session on text analytics, and the entire day was how to do text analytics. At no point in time did we talk about when not to do text analytics. And my fear is unless we start having this discussion and we encourage this discussion, we're going to end up, I think, doing ourselves a disservice because we will discredit the tools as tools for evaluation. I mean, entirely honest, some of the worst econometrics I have ever seen have been in evaluations. Um, because um, you know you have a lot of people who get the tool, who don't have the training to understand the limitations of it, and who overinterpret the results. Um, last thing I'll say, and this goes back to a number is not a fact. Um, I, I, I had a, uh, I managed a unit once, and when I left them, I had mugs made for everyone on the team that said a number is not a fact. Uh, just to remind them, because there's a lot of alternative facts out there, and the more and more you s have out on the internet, the more you're going to get garbage back when you ask questions. So, thanks. Okay, one quick comment over here. Uh, because time is almost up. Uh, I'm Sapusan Meng, I'm working for IFAD as a practitioner. Uh, Yes, one uh, uh, question is on the data governance. I don't know whether any uh, experience that you have on the data governance uh, at the national level, uh, basically. Because when we're talking about innovation, we're talking about AIs. You know, the tool we use, for example, like we have, uh, I don't know whether you are aware about the camera AIs. We use camera AIs to uh, turn into text somewhere, something like that. But information is also sent it to the producer also. So if we import it from other country, I mean, that data we can also transfer to other. So the national security may have some uh, issue with that. Uh, there is also a uh, benefit uh, from this also. For example, uh, I mean, between line department, ministry has share information so that we can get the benefit from that, for example, the information from tax department, the information about utility expense of the farmer may also be uh, very useful for us to do the evaluation. So uh, uh, just a quick question about your experience to deal with this uh, data governing uh, system in the country. Thank you. Well, colleagues, unfortunately, um, the organizers told me time is time is up. Um, I would just in, encourage you to get in, in touch with, with <laughs> Patricia and 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 Dugan, and they will come 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 to you. Um, you know, they um, numbers are not a fact from the World Bank. I mean, that that's that's great. Um, <laughs> fully agree with you, <laughs> and and um, no. Uh, 
point point well 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 taken so um you know your your comments were really really important data governance we we can take it off offline as well uh, esteemed colleagues uh, give a hand to the panelists thank you so much